Aston Martin's Virage is a handcrafted luxury sports GT that brings together everything that's great about this iconic British brand, slotting in between its least and most expensive sporting models. If you like Aston's, you'll love it. Even if you don't, it can still set out to seduce. Aston Martin appears to have a supercar to meet every need. The Vantage at one end of the range to take on top Porsche 911s and Maserati GTs. The DBS at the other to embarrass GT orientated Ferraris. And in between since 2003, we've had the DB9, the car that launched this iconic British brand into the modern era. An intentionally less focused sports car than its two stable mates, aimed more at gentleman grand touring with perhaps the odd mountain pass thrown in. A more laid back alternative, too laid back, in fact, for a small but significant part of Aston's potential client base. People who wanted to step up from the Vantage, but didn't want to have to win the lottery in order to afford a DBS. People who potentially are going to like this Virage model very much indeed. It goes without saying just how important it is for the brand to properly fill this gap in the middle of its range. Relying on the DB9 to do so, to be frank, wasn't really working. That, after all, was a car with a design dating back to 2003, a lifetime in supercar terms. Plus, it had an older image that matched its comfort-orientated driving experience. Though that model still had its place in the Aston Martin lineup, it needed to share the mid-range limelight with a younger feeling, more dynamically orientated stablemate. A car offering a sharper, more powerful and sophisticated take on DB9 motoring that wasn't quite as hardcore and extreme as the DBS. A car like this Virage. Here we're promised are all the best bits of Aston Martin rolled up into one perfect package. Sounds good, but then Aston Martins always do. Let's check out the reality. Back in 1988, I drove an Aston Martin Virage, and I didn't like it. You paid for the original version's oral fireworks and straight line speed with a heavy, stodgy and generally uninspiring drive, accompanied by a fearsome thirst for fuel. But then, that was back in the days when Aston buyers bought the brand rather than the models that it made. These people knew that the cars they drove wouldn't handle or be screwed together as well as the German or Italian alternatives, and they didn't care. But it was a recipe for a sports car cottage industry rather than long-term profit, and Ford knew it when they took over the brand at the end of the 20th century, bankrolling a new VH chassis that would go on to undergird a whole series of modern Astons, culminating with this one, launched in 2011. It just goes to show what an injection of capital will do. So much has that VH chassis changed our perceptions of Aston Martin since we first saw it on Vanquish and DB9 models that experts now talk of this British mark in the same breath as Ferrari and Maserati, while Porsche and Mercedes benchmark their most magnificent models against it. Which all explains why I'm setting out in another Virage badged Aston Martin just over three decades on with very different expectations. Behind the wheel, as usual with this brand, the feeling is different from that in any other car. There's something uh, about the cabin of an Aston Martin that sets it apart. And there's definitely something about the fearsomely glorious bark of the aluminium V12 as you stamp on the throttle, preparing you for what promises to be a unique experience. A thoroughbred sports car deserves a thoroughbred engine, and this is exactly that. Essentially the same hand-built 6-litre unit found in the 470 brake horsepower DB9 and the 510 brake horsepower DBS, but here slotting neatly between the two, developing 490 brake horsepower. Now, on paper, its figures certainly stack up, this unit developing 80% of its power from as little as 1500 RPM. That's courtesy of a thumping 570 newton meters of torque and one of the most impressive power to weight ratios in the class. But all, all that really doesn't prepare you for the experience on offer when the road opens up enough for you to bury your brogues in the carpet. Punch this sport button and the throttle sharpens 
the gear shift of the Touchtronic 2 automatic six-speed box that all virages must have quickens and the uh, throttle bypass valves open a little earlier to release a stirring howl as 60 flashes by from rest in just 4.6 seconds, assuming that you're quick with your flipping of the lovely magnesium alloy gear shift paddles. Were a runway to be on hand, uh, you'd reach 186 miles an hour flat out, for Aston sees no need to uh, impose on its buyers the 155 mile an hour speed limiter that you find in this model's German rivals. So yes, whether you specify this car in coupe or equally powerful Volante form, it's very, very fast. But then, so is every Aston Martin sports car. What the DB9 never had, and therefore what the all-important mid-range section of this British brand's lineup could never offer, was a really dynamic driving experience. Yes, the DB9 was great to drive. Yes, in theory, you could take it round Monza on your way to Monaco but in practice, you probably never would. If I tell you that this Virage is different, then don't misunderstand me by thinking that it's the kind of scruff of the neck sports car you could realistically take on a track day. For that, you're better off paying less for a Vantage or more for a DBS. This is still an old school GT at heart, but it's one with a riotously entertaining side to its nature. For that, I think we have primarily to thank the clever adaptive damping system first seen on the DBS, which aims to meld the character and abilities of two cars into one brilliantly executed package. Leave this little damper button alone and unseen by the driver, the car will switch continuously through five different comfort modes based on sensor readings from throttle, steering and brakes and it creates a drive that's comfortable, that's laid back, but that's also rewarding. Like a DB9, only better. Punch this little damper button though and everything changes. There are again five automatically changeable settings, but this time the red mist has descended upon them. Instantly you feel more involved and want to be so as the revs rise and you feel more at one with the road reassured by the powerfully responsive standard fit ceramic brakes. It's all slightly less of an extreme experience than the one you get in a DBS, but it's one that you'll want to repeat more often. And for me, that makes it better. Now you don't need me to tell you that this is a beautiful car. Where you may need my help is in differentiating it from Aston Martin's DB9 and DBS models. Design director Marek Reichmann is clearly unwilling to meddle with a winning formula when it comes to the assertive elegance and quiet potency that characterises every model in the range, and especially this one. My job would be made easier if we were to be standing in an Aston Martin showroom with the mellower looks of a DB9 on one side and the brashness that characterises a DBS on the other. But I'm not going to cheat by doing that. I'm going to ask you to mark this car on its own aesthetic merits. To admire the smarter front grille, the all new front wings with their side strakes incorporating six LEDs that form the side repeaters. Then there are the flared out side sills that sit below reshaped doors and the wider rear wings that incorporate the gorgeous 20 inch alloys. The whole thing is even more beautiful in Volante convertible form, perfectly proportioned from every angle, roof up or down. The convertible top retracts at the press of a button and stows beneath a hard tonneau cover that closes flush with the rear bodywork, leaving the lines of the car flowing and unbroken. The thin silhouette fabric top is compact when stowed, enabling this Volante to keep the coupe model's optional rear seats and much of its boot space. Whatever your choice of body style, you enter in through unique swan wing doors that open outwards yet upwards, easing access and avoiding high curbs. Inside you'll find hand-stitched bridge of wear leather swathing an interior dominated by a swooping central panel containing all the major controls. From the magnesium gear shift paddles, glass switches, and leather wrapped steering wheel to the beautifully engineered aluminium instrument faces, everything is of the highest quality and finished to perfection. 
I could though do without the emotional control unit, a little square you slot into the centre of the dash to fire the engine, which to me offers no real advantages over a conventional key and is fiddlier to use. As usual with Aston Autos, the normal conventional gear stick is replaced by large P, R, N and D buttons towards the top of the centre console. Now it's an arrangement that feels a little awkward at first but it's one that you quickly adjust to. What isn't usual from this brand though is provision of a decent sat nav system, the usual awful Volvo source package here replaced by a proper fully integrated Garmin system operated by a four-way joystick and outputting mapping information to a high resolution six and a half inch colour screen. Unlike some Aston models, rear seats are provided here, though some might feel that calling them seats is stretching things a bit. For most owners, these immaculately trimmed chairs represent carriage space for designer shopping bags or Hugo Boss jackets, but they can be pressed into service for very young children should the need arise. Or you can choose to delete them completely when ordering your car to release a bit more in-cabin storage space. Out back, there's a 184 litre boot in this coupe model, falling in size to 152 litres if you specify the Volante convertible version. Now you're looking at an asking price of around £150,000 for this coupe and around £160,000 for the Volante convertible. Sounds a lot, doesn't it? But look a little closer and the Virage does a pretty good job at justifying that figure. It does pretty much everything a Aston Martin DB9 can do. A car that when fitted with this one's fiendishly powerful carbon ceramic brakes would cost you just £15,000 less. And that's a premium that here buys you a much classier interior, a more powerful engine and a much cleverer suspension system. Add in the smarter looks and the beefier residual values that you'll get from this newer model and this is an obvious choice for Aston fans wanting and able to afford to take a step up from the Vantage. But of course not everyone with £150,000 to spend on a supercar is an Aston fan and those who aren't might be tempted to save around £5,000 over the cost of this coupe and go for Ferrari's California with its folding metal roof but it's an uglier car in most people's estimation and gives you 30 brake horsepower less. Advantage Aston. Equipment levels are as good as you'd expect for a vehicle carrying this price tag, though it's a bit surprising to see an auto dimming mirror on the options list. Still, you do get a full grain leather interior with Alcantara headlining, walnut fascia trim, an iridium silver centre console and electroluminescent displays, plus there are a whole host of electronics to play with, chief attraction being the 700 watt Dolby Pro Logic stereo system with integrated iPod connection. Customers also receive a set of gorgeous 20 inch alloy wheels through which you can glimpse those expensive ceramic brakes, the Touchtronic 2 auto gearbox, that adaptive damping system, tyre pressure sensors, a hard disk for the sat-nav, cruise control, front and rear parking sensors, heated electrically adjustable sports seats, a trip computer, power folding mirrors and even a boot mounted umbrella as well as a tracking device to return the car to you should it be stolen. Safety wise though there are twin front and side airbags it's disappointing to find that curtain bags are missing. Still, you do get all the usual electronic acronyms to try and ensure that they'll never be needed, including a three-stage dynamic stability control system, which has a track mode in which the electronic nannying is relaxed a bit and can be switched off completely for tail-out antics. Despite the reasonable value proposition it offers, the Virage is never going to be an inexpensive vehicle to own. There's top of the shop Group 50 insurance for a start. Still, uh, strong residual values do offer some compensation when it comes to consideration of the 18.8 .8 miles to the gallon combined cycle fuel reading, which by the way falls to 12.7 miles to the gallon around town, and the 349 grams per kilometre CO2 reading. You think that you could hardly annoy Greenpeace more by attaching a whaling harpoon gun to the bonnet. Yet, should you be inveigled into conversation with a bearded type, 
then you could point out that in some ways this car is very green indeed. There's no waste for recycling needed because due to its build, no recycling is required. There's nothing to rust and nothing to decay. Look after your Aston and in 50 years time it should still be exciting people in just the same way. I started off, as many have with this model, wondering whether the Virage was a niche too far for Aston Martin. After all, was there not a Vantage to take on Porsche and Maserati, a DB9 to offer Bentley buyers a sportier choice, and the DBS to take on Ferrari? What could this car offer that was in any way different? Quite a lot, as it turned out. It really does distill everything that Aston has learnt in a momentous last decade of production into one desirable package. It's a fully fledged supercar in a way that a Vantage can never be. It's a B-roll brawler in a way that a DB9 doesn't want to be. And it's an everyday usable pleasure in a way that DBS doesn't need to be. There are, it's true, better handling rivals. There are faster ones. But there are very few more desirable choices if life has brought you to the fortunate point of being able to write a check for a machine like this. It's a car you'll never tire of driving, never tire of hearing, never tire of owning. An Aston Martin through and through. <laughs>